everybody, and thank you for attending this this uh, meetup. Uh, I'm also looking forward this occasion to this occasion here. Um, it's interesting always to speak to people in the agile community, but I think uh, when Pierre invites, that means we have also some interesting minds around the agile community. So that's um, probably going to be helpful. Um, so, uh, what am I going to uh, talk about today? So, the title is Agile Structures, Agile Behavior and the Nature of Help. Um, I think first I'm going to say a little bit about my background, um, because that explains probably also some of my argumentation and what I will be talking about and what I will not be talking about. And um, then I uh, will talk exactly about this part, structure and behavior. Uh, and then focus on, on the help part, what that, that does it mean, what's the consequences. And uh, in the end, there is some part where it's more behavior focused. Uh, what would it mean for, you know, in which direction could you explore that? Um, what I also invite you, if you, if you want to, inter you know, have questions or comments or anything, why not unmute and interrupt? Because I'm, you know, I have some notes. I don't have slides, or I have actually one slide which I might show you towards the end. But for the rest, I don't want this to be a slideshow. And so, you know, if you have a conversation, if you um, want to interact, let's do that. I have absolutely no problem. Um, I can also anytime change the structure and the way that we are going through this. Um, so maybe for the, uh, for a start, something a bit about my background. I'm. Uh, probably the odd one out already from education. I'm a historical anthropologist by education. At the time when I started uh, st my studies, it was called cultural history, and later it was called historical anthropology. Um, and uh, I worked already as a student and later on in HR. Um, I worked quite a bit in knowledge management, a lot of HR projects. And then I moved into consulting and training. And when I did so, um, the, I worked with a mid-sized firm based in St. Gallen. And those of you who are familiar with uh, probably the German-speaking uh, management world, um, St. Gallen is special because they um, have a certain approach. The approach is to understand management not so much as you know, the question of how do you do marketing, how do you do production, and so on. But first of all, how do social systems work? So the theory of social systems and the science of systems is kind of the foundation on which you go then into any kind of specialization. And um, I did a lot of leadership training and, and leadership consulting. My focus was always uh, people-oriented. Um, a lot of, of development of culture, for example, change management and so on. And then I... Um, have that, like that's 2012 i founded my own company palladio and uh, i'm operating this company as a network and we are focused on helping leaders and uh, their organizations to become to function better if you want especially in highly dynamic and highly complex environments that's a relative thing of course if you are in a post-merger integration then your environment is very complex and, and dynamic and sometimes it also has to do with, with the kind of market that you're in. Um, yeah, I think that's so, so much about the background. Now, what does that, what, in what relation towards Agile does that put me? Um, I am not an Agile coach. I mean, I have an education as a Scrum Master, but I've never worked as a Scrum Master. I don't intend to work as a Scrum Master. I don't intend to do any introduction of Agile processes like Scrum, for example, um, into a company. However, I have uh, come into contact with the Agile movement a lot, um, from usually from the interface with other parts of the organization. That can be upwards, uh, management, leadership, um, or that can be when there are organizations where software plays a part, but it's not a large part. And then the question is, uh, you know, how do the software developing part of the organization interact with product developing part of the inter organization? And how does these developing parts of the organization interact with things like sales or production or, or other um, parts? And so I have always been, if you want, on the fringes of the Agile movement. And I think it's from this perspective of, of overlap um, between the core, if you want, of, of Agile 
and what is around and what could be extensions or what could not be extensions uh, of the agile man mindsets and how it interacts with mindsets that are out there. Um, that I want also to, to talk to you about this idea about structures and behaviors and the nature of health. And um, to start with, I want to share with you an observation that I have made when um, actually when in, in a lot of interaction with people like Pierre, uh, Agile conferences, um, people working in Agile within my client organizations, but also um, in, in contexts uh, where, for example, it's about finding new ways of work. So the whole movement with responsive organizations uh, or things like teal organizations, um, what you found there as well. Um, if you take a step back, and look what people are talking about when they are talking about Agile. You can, there are different ways in which you can make an organization perform and improve that performance. And one way is that you improve the, what I would call as a, as a metaphor, if you want, the operating system of an organization. So it's about structures, it's about processes, it's about roles. Maybe it's about rules of the game, but rules that are shared. So, uh, for example, if you if you introduce Scrum, uh, you might have you know the different the different things that are in the Scrum handbook that people might apply, and if people stick to that, then um, you already get hopefully if you if if the context is right, you have already a good performance. Um, I also like to to make that observation completely independent of Agile. So just to give you an example from, from classical ways of, of being productive with an organization, you can think about something like management by objectives as part of the operating system of an organization. And you can say, you know, we have a process and I don't know, somewhere at the end of the year, uh, the objectives are defined for the next year. And usually before that, you have something like a budget or a strategy and it cascades down the organization so that the process part and then you have maybe something like a form and you have a deadline and you know everybody is invited to have a conversation between the direct reports and their superior and to fill in the you know to answer the questions in the form and to fill in the form now if that form and that process has been intelligently designed you will get you know somewhere you will get quite good objectives but if you think about it, you can do all these things and still, for example, formulate the wrong objectives or formulate objectives in a way which are still, you know, which have a big potential of misunderstandings. So what we can also look at, what makes an organization perform is individual competence. How well do people know what they're doing independent of what this operating system is asking them to do or beyond that? So for example, when we stick with objectives, Somebody might, might start with something as simple as SMART or any other kind of acronym. How do you formulate objectives? What should be in there to make it better? But then also take a step out and think, for example, about delegation and think about, you know, how do you better use all the capabilities of somebody to make a contribution by making clear what result you expect at the end and what deliverable the person should have and by making clear what framework or what kind of space of, of maneuver the person should have um, in order to deliver that. So what, can, what are the decisions that the person can take? And if you understand delegation well, then you realize, for example, that if you delegate something to a person and then intervene all the time with nice suggestions and, you know, why don't you do it this way and not that way, then you kill the delegation again. So that is something that you should not do. Now, this is something that people either know or don't know, and they know it by experience or they know it by learning, but it's not something that you could put in a process. It's not something that you can put in a checklist and then everybody just read the checklist and do your job. So it, it happens in a different way from the operating system. So we have this, this like two things, operating system and um, individual competence. And what I observe is that a lot of what's going on in Agile is actually about the operating system and making the operating system better. And sometimes then people complain, you know, you hear things like Agile mindset, or you hear things like be agile, don't just do agile. Or sometimes you hear things like don't be agile when people are just following blindly the operating system part, but actually they haven't understood what it's all about and they're doing it badly. And so I think it's, um, it's healthy also for something like an agile movement 
to think in a balance between what you do through the operating system and what you do you do through the individual competence because there will be always parts that can make your performance better which you cannot cover with the operating system um, the same or, or a similar way of looking at it and which points out an aspect of the operating system is an example or a, a yeah it's a, it's a metaphor um, that is actually used a lot by Dave Snowden. I, I have worked for some time uh, a bit with Dave Snowden and, and I, as you will see, I appreciate a lot of his thoughts. Um, and that's the idea of recipes and chefs. If you think about cooking, um, you know, I, I remember as a student when I started cooking and especially cooking for people whom I invited for dinner, um, there are cookbooks. And cookbooks, uh, especially if you take the right one, they just tell you, okay, that's the ingredients, and now take this and that, this, and boil it, and all these kind of things. And if you just follow the recipe, then you will get quite a nice meal. And um, it might say something like, put flour in, in the sauce towards the end. And you do that, and you get a nicely bound sauce. But you don't understand necessarily what it means to bind the sauce. And the problem arrives for example when you realize oh i forgot to buy flour and i don't have flour so when you just follow the recipe you, you won't do anything and you will have a bad sauce if you go beyond that and if you understand how to cook then you understand okay the flour is here in order to bind the sauce if i don't have flour i can take butter maybe or i can boil potatoes with the sauce and then take them out that makes make may do the job as well or I can put, uh, you know, egg yolk, but then I have to be careful not to boil it over 70 degrees because otherwise the sauce goes bad. So you have to know some things about the background and then you become more flexible and you can use different ingredients to produce a similar effect. And this idea between recipes and knowing how to cook, what the chef usually does, this idea I think is very helpful when you, when you think about this operating system and the individual competence, because of course the individual competence becomes really powerful when, when it's about knowing how to cook and not just using recipes. Um, and that has to do with the fact that when you know how to cook or when you are individually competent, then you are competent to adapt solutions to your individual context. And uh, usually when you, are, when you use recipes, then if the context is not the right context for the, um, uh, for the recipe, then it will not work. And um, this is another thing that I observe, not just in the Agile movement, but in anything that maybe is, is fashionable and is then used, that there is this tendency to go for recipes because recipes give you safety, you know, that's how you follow it, that's how you do holacracy, and so let's do holacracy. And um, if, you, if you go in this direction and you can go back, you know, the whole thing about lean or about Six Sigma, about total quality management, many of these things, you always have a part of people who approach this whole thing as a recipe thing. And what you want to do with the recipe is copy paste, independent yeah, yeah. on the context that we're talking about. And so if you go, however, if you want to make it apt for the context, then you have to know a little bit more and then we need this individual competence. Now, I believe that this is extremely important and there are two implications of this thing about contextual and copy paste. One is when you think about what is the purpose of Agile. And sometimes, Again, some people, well, luckily not everybody, but some people, they are big fans of something like the Agile movement. And you have the impression the purpose of Agile is to be true to the Agile Manifesto or to the Scrum Handbook or whatever they have. So it's a kind of normative system. That's how it needs to be done. If you want to be part of this movement, then that's how you do it. And end of discussion, that's the nice thing. You don't have to question this, whether it fits to your context or not. I believe that, um, however, anything which has to do with providing results or producing results as an organization, the moment you have to define the purpose of this organization, everything is pragmatic to that purpose. And for example, in some contexts where I have to do with agile transformations, um, part of what I do is actually let's develop the purpose of agile. Why do we need agile here? Why is agile a good tool why is it a good idea to be do, done here um, to develop that from what the organization is doing 
and uh, you know how it's reacting to its environment. That can be things like the VUCA world, we all know about that, you know, complexity and so on. But let me give you an example which, which is not typical because it's not about software. Um, I am at the very beginning of a very you know, slow and cautious movement towards agile of a private bank. And in a private bank, in this private bank, this is a mid-sized private bank, and um, what you have there is you, you do have already some software developing teams who are already using Scrum and they are happy with it and that's good. And you have some other parts of the bank which have no idea about that. And you have some parts of the bank which have heard, well, there is this thing about agility. We want to learn more about it. And uh, the first thing we did is we developed the need for agility and what agility would need to provide for the bank in the context of this bank. And just to give you this example a bit more, so this bank is one of the, of, of the reasons that we found has to do with its size. So, so you have to imagine, I imagine none of us has the privilege of being a private banking customer, but private banking exists in, this, in big banks like Barclays or Deutsche Bank or UBS, and it exists in boutique banks with 20 or 30 employees. Um, and there are these mid-sized with a few hundred employees banks. And uh, imagine, for example, when you're just entering that uh, stage of being a customer for private banking, so you're not super, super rich, you're just rich enough in order to, to be a private banking customer. When you go to the big banks, you will go to their, you will become a customer of their private banking department, but the kind of service that you get from that private banking department is still highly standardized. You're a low level private banking customer, you will get a lot of standard services. So for example, you will get uh, you know, a lot of time spent with the salesperson, or in that uh, context, it's called the relationship manager, but you will never have access to an expert when it's, for example, that, I don't know, you have a company and it's about succession, you have your next generation that wants to step in, so how do you do that you know, with taxes and with all these kind of things? You will get standard answers from the system of this big bank. In a small boutique kind of bank, you might get something very personal, but 30 people, there are not so many experts in you know, very specialized niche topics. But if you're talking about the mid-sized banks, like in this case, they have about 900 people, um, they have experts like the big ones. And the difference is they can make these experts available to any kind of private banking customer, even if it's at the low level. Which means that as a private banking customer, it's a unique selling proposition to say, we can give you a direct individualized solution, customized solution involving the experts that, are, experts that are necessary to design that. Now, if you go in the bank and say, what does the bank need to be able to do? How does it need to be able to perform to deliver that? What you realize is we need to be able to build exceptions fast. We need to be able to make very fast informal contact from the sales operation into the expert units who have other things to do. So the question is all about prioritization between their projects and the individual customer requests. And the, the question is a, is a lot about uh, fast, informal, on-the-spot collaboration between the silos, if you want. Now, we call this Agility 2, although it has nothing to do with iterative development of things. But if you go, for example, into the principles of the Agile Manifesto, you feel a lot of overlap. So how can we be, how can we be better at delivering this kind of service to the customer is then a purpose that is very context specific for this company and that for many other agile companies it has nothing to do. Um, but for them, it is so important that the question of, okay, where do we now involve what kind of activities um, uh, all depends on being able to deliver on that. And there's a few other uh, focus points that I have chosen. So this thing about, about um, uh, being contextual when it is about the purpose of an agile transformation. Um, the second implementation, in, in, the second um, implication of contextual versus copy paste, however, is the one that I would like to focus on more. Because if you think about it, how can you be good and how can you get help to become better in any situation? Well, usually what you do is you try to find something that is useful for your situation that goes beyond inventing and improvisation. So you have an experience from somewhere, you have a standard from somewhere, you have anything that you use in your context. 
and you, you try to get it from somewhere else. And what usually also happens is by doing that, you cluster your reality. You say, my context is similar to another context. I can learn from the other context where I've made experience and transfer it to my context group. And um, the way that you can cluster uh, the context already on the highest possible level of abstraction, one way is, for example, the Kinevin framework. I imagine that's all known to you. You know, Dave Snowden, difference between two kinds of ordered context, the obvious context and the complicated context. And then you have the complex. Let me give an, oh, let me give an introduction into Kinevin framework. Um, so Kinevin framework, uh, written C Y N E F I N, um, is something that has been developed amongst others by Dave Snowden, and he's very much associated with it. Um, so not Edward Snowden, but Dave Snowden. Um, there is a very good uh, Harvard Business Review article uh, that describes it. Basically, um, and I think it's good to start with pointing out one of the, um, uh, of the key differences and what I think is an advantage of this model over so many other models. If you look at most of the books on, on management and methods, uh, you know, agile or not agile, it doesn't matter. Um, if you look at, at anything that shows, shows you, you know, that wants to help you in your profession, then most of these books are normative. Most, most of the models say, this is a good thing to do, probably always and everywhere. And there are very few models which say, hmm, it depends. Let me tell you on what it can depend, what you need to do, because it's different depending on the situation. For example, those of you who are more, uh, have a more background in management and leadership, there is the model of situational leadership from the 70s, which is, not a normative model, it's a so-called contingency model. So it depends what situation you have, and then you have to adapt your kind of leadership to the situation. Now, um, the, the Kinevin framework is also a contingency model, and it basically is about how do you perceive your environment and take decisions? And how, does this, how is this fundamentally different depending on the environment that you're in? And as I've said, the first, it, it divides the environment into, well, first, it's all unknown. That's actually the fifth area. Huh? So it's the part where you don't know what environment you're in. But then there are four kinds of environments where you know that you're, you're in and they are different. Two of them are ordered. The other are complex and chaotic. The two ordered ones, one is called obvious. That has earlier been, been called simple. And the other is called complicated. And now let, let me give you a, a, a very fast kind of introduction into these from something very practical, but not work related. Let's call shopping. So if you think about shopping and how you shop for, you know, things like sugar, salt, toilet paper, and so on, um, what you realize is usually everybody, you have a preferred supermarket that you go to, the product is always there in the supermarket. You usually have some kind of list. So when, when you lack the product, you put it on some kind of shopping list. And you usually have a, a routine how you go about this. It's always Saturday morning or it's always after work or something like that, how you do your shopping. So it's very much about processes, checklists, standards, always the same way. You know, you don't, you, you don't shop for toilet paper the way you might be shopping for clothes, for example, that you say, hmm, let's try different ones and take a long time to decide and all these kind of things. You just always take the same or always the cheapest one. And that's how you do it. So there's very much about routine going about that. You look at the situation, you put it in a category, that's the one for the supermarket, that's the one, uh, I don't know, for the bakery, and uh, then you, you just go through the procedure. The same in work, you know, you have a, a case which is, stand, you know, case 5B, you apply procedure 5B, and that's how you do it. A lot of, of industrial productivity comes from this, that you standardize things and you have a standard approach to them. Now, if we change that into complicated, in complicated contexts, it's still very clear how things are connected, but you have to do a lot of research. You have to need, you need expertise to understand it exactly. So, you know, like a, 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 the movement of a mechanical watch, um, if there is one wheel that is wrong, you have to find the one wheel that might be take a long time, but when you found it, you replace it and everything works again. So if you use this in shopping, what I like as an example, for example, if you have a, um, to replace a window handle, 
uh, you, you know, there is exactly one that fits. Your window handle is broken, you need a new one. You want it to look exactly the same as the others in your house. So therefore, um, there is exactly one solution, but you have no idea where to find it. So you go and ask experts, the one who built your house maybe, or you go to a special shop, or you make a research on the internet. And at one point, you will find the replacement handle, the one solution that fits. So again, we have, we have things are connected, things are, are clear, there's a clear cause and effect relation, but you need to do research to find it out because there's so much uh, stuff that, that, that you can see. That's complicated. And now if we move into complex, let me make you an example of, of a completely different shopping experience. Imagine that you're a chef of a restaurant and um, basically you have a, another menu every night. You are famous for fresh market cuisine, especially fish. And so every morning you go to the market and, you know, depending on what the fishermen could catch, there is some different things on display. Some are fresh, some are not so good. And you have some idea maybe of the menu that you want to do this, uh, this evening, but you're open to suggestions. So you go and you have a first round and say, you know, maybe seafood might be a good idea. And I usually do this. Well, I could do it with ananas this time. Oh no, but the ananas are not looking good. So let's do something else. And you make several rounds and you try out your ideas. And over time, your idea of what you will buy and what the menu of the night will be will emerge. And it will maybe improve over time. You realize certain things your customers don't like, so you won't try them again. Some other things your customers like a lot, so you try them more often. But you're always, you, you never go to the market and say, it needs to be this, this, and this, and otherwise I won't do anything. You're always open, you're always reacting to the environment of the market. And so, in complex, actually, what happens is that things are not rigidly connected. They are not fixed connected. There is not a clear visibility between cause and effect. There are tendencies. There are patterns. There are dispositions in the system. The system oh. has a tendency to react this way. Yes, go ahead. Well, one question. We, we think we are not connected in a complex system or we don't see it? Because this is different because we assume that they are not connected, but because we okay. don't understand, we yeah. say it's complex. I, I, if I said not connected, it was a mistake. We are, things are loosely connected. So what does it mean? Usually my, my shortest definition of a complex system is many things that have a intricate interdependency, which means many things depend on many things, but you can't see every interdependency. It's not everything that depends on everything, but some on some. And so if you move one part of the system, you have a lot of surprises, a lot of, of side effects, a lot of things that don't go the direction that you, that, that you intend. Uh, you know, you can make small examples, like for example, a team culture, the group dynamic of a meeting, it's already complex because somebody maybe has come from somewhere else and is still angry about the other guy. And you don't know that, but it will have an effect on how they behave in the meeting. For, for, for you, uh, sniffing is not a recipe too? No. No? No. Why not? Because, because what it tells you is a very abstract way of how you, you can behave differently. It tells you, okay, make a difference between ordered and complex, for example, but it don't tell you in detail what you need to do. When I tell you, on, now I'm quoting really, uh, Kenevin, when I say, okay, in, in, you know, in an obvious context, what you do is, you, um, uh, you perceive what's going on, you categorize what you, what you have seen, and you act on the category. What you do in a complicated is you perceive what's going on, you sense, and, um, and then you analyze. You have to analyze more about the problem and so on, and then you can respond. What you do in complex is you, you don't first just perceive. You have to probe the system. Like little, you know, what, what is working here? What is not working? How could this react? What if I pull here? What if I push there? And you sense what's going on and you can respond then based on what you, what, what you perceive. So this is on, I mean, if you want to call this a recipe, it's a recipe on such a high level. It's like, actually, um, you, can, you can compare it to a cookbook that I've received once, um, which doesn't include any recipe, but it includes combination. It says, for example, seafood goes good with exotic fruit. You know, or um, uh, pork and 
kinds of beans and and you know lentils and so on it doesn't say how you do that then what you do but you get it gives you inspiration so and that's actually what i will get to in a moment how you know how it changes also how recipes or other ways of helping you can actually help um, uh, be helpful and how you have to use them so anyway to conclude the thing on the Kenevan framework um the, there is the fourth uh, domain which is called chaotic in chaotic that's where we have complete coincidence things are at least if they are connected you know once they're connected they're not connected imagine a house on fire so you, you have no way of understanding but you have to act fast so what you do is you act first hope you know start running hopefully you will learn something on the way so you perceive what's going on and you can improve your acting you can respond on that but um uh you will you will know that from the very beginning when you start acting you will create a lot of damage because you have no time to find out what is the best way of reacting in this situation uh, did i understand did you want to say something else or not because I, I saw your hand a moment no no uh just just wanted to to uh to add that uh, yeah. uh, we, we, we used to think that cause and effect is in all the complex system is, is we, we can understand all the system but at the end we're starting to understand that we don't understand a lot of things so we call it complex because we don't understand it we call it chaotic because we don't see the dots connecting the things so 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 we we we, we, we have we have an obsession as humans we, we because we want to uh, try to to put things in a variables and we try to put things in a system and then if we don't understand things we we, we it's, it's it's like uh we we feel frustrated and and yeah. and that, that that's why i think this kind of recipe because even complexity is li line i don't know how to say in spain english is line analyze it you you you, you all, all the complexity is okay you, you just you just categorize the complexity in four steps and then uh, complexity is, is done so yeah. for me it's like a uh, like okay, it can help you to understand a little bit, but doesn't mean that with that uh, framework or, or 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 recipe, we will help you to really understand if you are understanding the complex system because you are yeah. assuming things. You you have some beliefs, you have some meta programs of 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 what do you of what do you think is is not connected between between a, a complex system. You will like what I will come to later in the in the talk. I'm sure. Um, uh, I think also for me personally, in my past, that has been a learning when, so I, I told you for nine years, I've worked in a company that has been based on systems theory and things like cybernetics. And um, basically the approach there is a bit, if we just add 200 more variables, then we will have a model which explains everything about the system. And the step to complexity theory, at least in the way, or complexity science in the way that I like to use it is, what if that is not the best way of dealing with it? What can you do then? Because you can do a lot of things. There are still a lot of things that you can do, a lot of things that are helpful. Um, for example, experiment. And if you, ex well, yeah, we'll get there. You know, if you experiment, you have to know, okay, if something works well, I can scale it up. But I always have to know, I will, I never understand all the reason why it works well. I might be, surfing on a pattern which is quite stable now but there will there might be um, reasons that destroy these patterns that i will not foresee so which means i will have always to be careful not to bet everything on this pattern always explore are there other patterns which we are becoming stronger and it may, may be better to you know spread out and have a portfolio um, or also, what do I do if this pattern becomes weaker, weaker or even very fast, goes over a tipping point and, and breaks? And um, I think that's, that's uh, already very helpful as a, as a way forward. That, for example, if you think about strategy, that you say, you know, let's become more clear what are the assumptions that our strategy is based on? What are indicators that our assumptions are getting worse, maybe even wrong? Um, how, not only how do we optimize ourselves to survive successfully in that one scenario that we believe to be the most probable in the future, but how do we put ourselves in a way that even in worse scenarios, in the, in the worst probable scenarios that we can imagine, we will also stay over water and stay alive. Maybe not that successfully, but still stay alive. So it's things about plan B, 
contingency planning and so on. So anyway, but to come back to, to that thing about the Kinevin framework as a contingency model. So um, when you think about it, how can now these four different areas, how does help and becoming better and learning actually work? Or learning is the wrong word. It's more about applying something that helps you become better. How does that work? Now, if you think about the obvious context, and so we said it's like shopping for household food and so on. Um, usually what you have is you have very, you can make classes, clusters of e events, like for example, I'm lacking sugar, I'm lacking salt, I'm lacking toilet paper, I'm lacking toothpaste, they're all for the supermarket. So I have this one cluster, which is that's the shopping list for the supermarket and Saturday morning by car is how I go and shop in the supermarket and everything is there. So in this big cluster supermarket stuff, I will be able to do a lot of my grocery shopping. And um, usually what happens is if you go into industrial context, you know, you have things like procedures, workflows, standards, checklists, and so on. And they work. It's worthwhile really optimizing a procedure because it is the same procedure is applied so many times because the cluster for which this procedure is, is used is big. And there, the whole recipe thing, you know, the recipes can be very detailed and they can be applied and it's worth doing that. Well, that's good. And it makes you get better. And even a, a beginner, you know, can go there, get the checklist and just go through the checklist and produce a good result. And that's fine. Now, if we move to complicated, um, what happens is the number of, of cases that you can cluster usually becomes smaller. Um, nice example, about a year ago, I had a big repair on the motor of my car. And basically, they had to access the crankshaft. So in order to access the crankshaft in a, in a motor of a car, you have to take out the whole motor. And as you can imagine, today's cars, they're so complicated that um, even mechanics working with that kind of car a lot, they don't know by heart how to take out the motor out of this car. So they have these checklists. And in that case, I went to a garage where they had this habit of printing the checklist on paper. <laughs> it was so huge. It was a long, long, you know, do this, then disconnect that, then open this, then open that. So it was a lot, a lot, a lot of things just in order to get that motor out. So the question at one point is, up to which point is it worthwhile writing a checklist for every case with knowing that the checklist will be so long and that the case happens so rarely? So, so the whole question of let's do everything with procedures and checklists changes. And you have to be more um, careful and probably what happens is that for example, so in one case, the checklist is long and we write a lot of checklists and it is expensive writing all these checklists and keeping them up to date and so on. Or you stop at a certain level and say, you know, we give you rough indications and then the details, you figure it out on the case and you're actually con contextual. Uh, an example there are, for example, purchasing criteria. So if you have things like in, in IT, for example, or in, in any kind of, of, of investment goods, um, you know, they might say over a certain amount, you need to consider at least four offers or you need to write a tender and it has to be, have these things in it or you have to do this kind of analysis. But it doesn't go into the detail of what are all the, de the details and how do you ex exactly choose four offers to get and all these kind of things and who will be in the committee to decide. Maybe there it's still open depending on the case. You can apply these standard uh, procedures for, for purchasing to many different cases. And the details, well, they're a question of, you know, the re responsible people sitting together and, and, and deciding on the spot what, how they want to do it. So what happens is that this very detailed way of getting there, or for example, also scientific evidence, it will stop. And there will be like a last mile that you will have to, I use now this sloppy word, improvise in the context. For this context, very customized, you have to design your, your solution here. Um, you can see that also when you look at something like the Scrum Handbook. It doesn't go into all the details of how you do things, so it leaves it open. And think about the reality, you know. Maybe you have a very specific situation in that team. I have this huge expert, but he has always the tendency to interrupt everybody else. So now you have to come up with a way, how can, I keep, how can we keep him from interrupting everybody else? This is a solution for your team only, for this person only, and you design it and you do something. But you don't go and search for a recipe in the Scrum Handbook that will tell you how to deal with that person. 
So, so you have like this, you know, high flying level of, of giving something like in the Scrum Handbook, and then you have these very detailed things. Or think about also modular approaches, like for example, how do you do estimates? There are various ways, and some of them have very detailed, again, descriptions, but you can replace them. And you can say, you know, uh, uh, do we do story points, or what, uh, what, what, use, what tools do we use? And you can also adapt those to your context if necessary. And now there is a fundamental shift if we move into the complex. Because in the complex, what usually happens is, well, um, you, this whole recipe book thing, it's very rare that it works. It works on a very general approach that maybe you learn something about how tipping points work, how attractive basins work, how emer emergent work. Many of these things which are maybe counterintuitive, but on a very, very generic level. And as soon as you go into your context, everything is very specific to your individual context. And I can give you an example that makes you understand it because what, what is behind it is that complex systems are heavily path dependent. That means that they carry their history with them. Um, if you, if I would, well, I don't have it here now, but if I would take a bottle and I would take my finger and just tip the bottle a little bit that is a little bit out of balance and then it would let go again and it, goes back into battle and maybe wobbles a little bit. And I would do this 10 times in a row. And either do it exactly the same way 10 times in a row, this bottle, which is not a complex system, this bottle will behave 10 times more or less the same. If I do it exactly the same, then it will behave exactly the same way. Now imagine that I have a person next to me standing and I do exactly the same thing with my index finger into their shoulder and push them a little bit and then let go again. Now, the first time they will react in one way, the second time already they will react a bit differently, the third time maybe they start getting annoyed. You know, if I do this 10 times, they will be angry, they will be, I don't know, they, they will avoid me, they will, they will fight back or anything like that. And this, if I do it the ninth time that I do it, I will get a very strange reaction, which I can only explain by the way that the other eight times have built up something. So that's the path dependency, the history of this, times of, that I have pushed have an impact on how the 10th time this person will react. And that's the case all the time in a complex system, which means that even if they look the same, several complex systems may look the same, if they have a slightly different history, at one time or another, they will react in different ways to the same approach. So this whole thing about copy pasting solutions is way more dangerous and way more at risk to be wrong. And you have to, this whole thing about customizing your approach is more imp important. Now, what does, it, does that mean? It means that if we want to be you know, helpful or to, to learn in doing it better in a complex system, usually the way to do that is not so much with principles and uh, with, sorry, with, with processes and procedures, but exactly how I already said it, with principles. Principle is more like you know, um, for example, I had uh, one case where it was actually a, a heuristics where the point was that sometimes you got customer complaints after a project that were to be avoided. And the principle was simply make sure that the, or do everything you can that the customer always has realistic expectations. Now, what does that mean? What do you do exactly? Well, that depends. It depends a lot if you have, you know, if you know the customer well and you have a lot of trust relationship and so on, maybe you do nothing. If the customer is new, you probably go and ask a lot of questions and you explain a lot of why you're doing certain things to avoid surprises. If you have a very critical customers, you probably want the stuff in writing and, you know, their agreement and signatures underneath because, you know, otherwise they would come and complain and you can show them that they have agreed to it. So depending on the situation, there are many very different ways of applying a principle. But still, the principle is helpful. Watch out that the customer doesn't get negative surprises. And so um, if you think about how you, you, you provide help and in, in such contexts, it is very mu much more um, uh, it is, or is fundamentally different in this complex domain in comparison to the ordered domains, the obvious and, and the complicated. And just to make the Kahneman framework close, I want to open the little bracket because I don't want to go into detail more about that. In the chaotic domain, what then happens is that often what you do is you try to provide help by giving a very rough indication beforehand. For example, if you think about the fire drill, 
You know, it says, first of all, leave the building. If the fire alarm is going, leave the building. Now, in some cases, you know, the way where the fire was, how intense it was, and some other people have been in their room, maybe elderly, it would have been okay to stop and get that person out first and, not, and then leave the building. But instead of writing a very detailed kind of, okay, decide whether and so on thing, you just say, first of all, leave the building, leave everything else to the specialist. And that's quite helpful. So sometimes it helps create damage. And another way of, of doing it, for example, is, is stuff like a plan B. I had a customer who actually survived the 2008 crisis very well just because a few years before they have said, let's always do a plan B strategy and let's always agree what indicators make us as a top management decide, you know, come together and decide whether we should move to plan B. So for example, they said, if we have more than 20% um, uh, uh, a drop in sales in comparison to last year, definitely we, we go to plan B. You know, so you have these decisions beforehand, which help you be fast and still quite okay in, the, in a chaotic environment. But if you go back now to this ordered versus complex uh, difference, um, look at it again, what kind of information is helpful? What kind of, of you know, how do, do these principles work? Well, there I would like to introduce something that comes from the theory of science. And actually it's a, a, th a theory of not just science, but science and scholarly ways of, of the humanities. Um, so if you look at that, um, science has actually a common belief in how they work. The belief is that what they are interested in is always not the individual case, but the type. So for example, they are studying a horse, not because to, in order to understand everything about this one horse, but about horses in general. So what this horse has in, in common with other horses, so that you can repeat it in the same conditions, you, you know, the idea of the experiment that can be repeated on the lab conditions. Um, maybe you go, you narrow this class down and say, it's not just about horses, any kind of horse, but this horse has been a racing horse and is now retired. And we want to know something about, you know, how aggressive they are in their behavior or something like that. And we want to learn from this horse about racing horses that are retired in general. So again, you have a cluster, you have a, a type that you are looking at. And um, if you look about how this result of science can be used in practice, we are very much in a more or less recipe book, copy paste approach. So we want science to give us something that helps us, for example, to deal with aggression in retired racing horses that we can use and that we know to function in almost all the cases. Um, in the complex environment, that's actually a difference because what we can use is more what's learned from the humanities. In the humanities, think about history, think about you know, literary scholarship. Um, if, you, if you look at the biography of Nelson Mandela, for example, the biography tries to explain the individual of Nelson Mandela, what is special about this one person, not what he has in common with a lot of other, whatever, revolutionaries or freedom fighters or any of these kind of things but Nelson Mandela particular. Maybe they might actually not, you know, there are many biographies you can write about Nelson Mandela. It depends on the perspective and that's also important. There is not one correct perspective of the biography of Nelson Mandela. You can have a look at the role of Nelson Mandela in the end of the apartheid, or you can have more a look about the importance and what he did in his life in prison and what it did to him. Uh, or you can look at the relationship he had with Winnie Mandela, which was a bit special, and what that tells us about the behavior of Nelson Mandela. So there are different perspectives, and nobody can say one of them is completely wrong and the other is right. No, you can also only measure whether the biography tells the relevant things to this perspective that it has chosen. Does it tell the thing that is relevant to overthrowing the apartheid? Because it has said, that's what I want to look at in Nelson Mandela. Now, when you compare it also to, to the scientific evidence, um, when you go to a practitioner, the practitioner does, I mean, if you have this thing about people learn about what horses do when, you know, aggression of, of retired racehorses, because I have a retired racehorses that is aggressive here, um, if, you approach, if you use the same kind of copy paste desire in somebody who reads the biography of Nelson Mandela, then, you know, the only reason to read the biography of Nelson Mandela is because I have also a racist government in a post-colonial state that I want to overthrow. 
and I want to know, know how to do this. Otherwise, I'm not interested in Nelson Mandela. And of course, that is not true. So the way what we learn from a biography of Nelson Mandela is, is more of inspiration. Maybe we learn something about how Nelson Mandela deals with bullies and it might inspire us to try something with a bullying behavior that we have at work. Or it, it's just the greatness of the person, of the character and strength of character that inspires us. And this helps us in a way or another. So the way this is helpful is much more improvised and is much more diffuse. It's not precise. For this, this book is useful and for everything else it's not useful. You can't say it in that. So there are many ways. It depends very much on, on you as a person, whether from this biography you can, you can get some value and what kind of value you can get in, in your practical application. Now, if we take that now back and see, okay, so what does this actually mean in the way that we can provide help? Um, we can say, well, the, the way people learn to deal with their own complex situation, their own complex context, it's probably we can be helpful by giving them more of an inspiration and not an instruction. We can't expect them to copy paste things because it will probably be wrong and we don't even understand how much wrong it will be. So therefore, we have a completely different relationship to the person who needs help or as a person of, or in search of help there is something else that we're looking for. We're looking for inspiration. We are looking for um, a way to enlarge our experience, but not in this precise copy-paste way that might still be useful in an order, especially in an obvious context. Uh, so for example, I mean, something that I often observe, you know, nowadays companies that are fashionable, like, like Spotify or Google, there are so many who look out to them and they want to copy that model. And they want, so they want to copy the, pro, pro, you know, the, the, the result of 30 years or in the case of, of um, no, actually in both cases, it's less than 30 years. But anyway, of 20 years of, of an individual cultural development of an organization, they want to take the results and copy paste it into an organization which has a completely different path, a completely different history and a completely different context. And that's, I believe, the wrong way to do it. However, you can still be inspired and say, how does knowing and understanding about how Google does it or how Spotify does it or how any other company does it, how can they inspire me to better build my own thing and especially build it if I build it in form of an experiment? I want to try out some stuff and see, you know, so I'm, I tweak it a bit, I do something else slightly, but it's inspired by what I've seen somewhere else and I see how my context reacts. I see whether this is something that could work here. And that, I think, is, is, is the correct way of doing this. Now, if I want to close the other bracket now and come back to what I said about operating system and individual competence, I believe that individual competence is a lot about going that last mile, about what is very complex, uh, context specific to my situation now, here, probably even very small, that is not covered by the operating system. And therefore, I need to have other ways of learning. Yeah, I said I, I'm going to say show one image at the end. Um, this here is, for example, my approach to try to, to help people get inspired and use some principles when it comes to how to deal in highly complex environments. And I believe you can take this and, and you know, into agile context, and especially this part, which is about individual competence and not just the operating model. That's where it can be helpful. How is this compass built? Well, in the begin in the center on the on the golden part there, you can see that it's the four words of the Kahneman framework. It's just representative for an idea of you need to have some understanding of complexity, some mental models which can be helpful for you. And you know, it's worthwhile building those mental models and improving them. Um, then the next circle is some principles, or you can also say some areas of focus. Where, how is it worth looking at my complex situation? In terms of, for example, well, one can say multiple perspectives, distributed intelligence. How useful is it to use different, various perspectives from different people and not get as fast as possible to the point where we are all aligned and we all have the same way of looking at our situation? Remove filters, how much, you know, how do we use relevance filters? Because we can't see everything, we can't perceive everything about our complex uh, situation. How useful are these filters? But sometimes also, 
how useful is it to try to remove them? For example, not just look at statistics, but have some customers on the phone and talk to them and see what they have to tell as a backstory to, to the statistics. Um, how to align autonomy. So on one hand, provide autonomy that people can react to the unpredictable and exceptional, and at the same time, work towards alignment. How do you do that? The granularity thing, you know, when do you look at the wood as a whole? When do you look at trees? When is it useful? When do you change between the two? And resilience, so this whole thing about not how to make a system that it doesn't break, but how to make a system that it can heal fast, that we can learn fast. And on the outside circle, you have activities like nudging, you know, how can you give little inputs into a system that will then have trigger effects and make and become bigger? How do you move on this on this thing between exploring and exploiting? So exploring new words, uh, innovation, finding out more about your complex environment, but you're not making any money, and exploiting when you are going down. That's, for example, something that the, the Scrum Circle does a lot. Explore would be the, the backlog, the backlog grooming, whereas exploit is, okay, once you've made the sprint backlog, you work on that, you work on nothing else, and that's how you do it. Um, then this whole thing about making sense, you know, how can you make sure that you collect the different ways that people explain their situation and therefore explain the complex system and where do you have to work towards an alignment of these explanations. Manage constraints, when you do you keep constraints very narrow and say that's what we do and nothing else and when do you keep them up that you say it's up to you, you can improvise, you can do what you want. Experiment, I think that needs no explanation. And then manage by vectors. So that's to be seen in, in opposition to managing by objective. So managing by objective is I define the result that I want to have at the end of the exercise, whereas management by vectors is I can't say, you know, I can say let's go north, that's good, and that includes an idea of south is a bad idea, huh? so what do we avoid it? But I can't say whether we will make it to Copenhagen or to, to, to Hamburg from, from here. So um, I can still give a direction and an orientation without defining the end result. I just define more of that and less of that. And then facilitate recovery, which is connected to resilience. So how can we make sure that we heal a lot? And as a conclusion, now that was a very, you know, just an overview. But as a conclusion, there is actually an offer that I want to make to the participant of this meetup. Um, because at the end of May and 21st to 23rd of May, I'm actually giving a three-day training on exactly this compass, understanding of complexity, what can you do as an individual who has to influence or provide results as a leader, let's call it, um, and how can you learn more about this behavior that is different in complex environments. And what I'm doing as a special offer here, this is a course that usually costs 2,400 Swiss francs, and I'm offering this for you at cost, which means 500 Swiss francs only. So if you're interested to learn more about that, um, just email me at info at palladio.net and uh, you know, I'll give you more information about it. Um, uh, so the three uh, 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 frameworks, I guess, uh, Bernard, that you talked about were, uh, this is Paul from Chicago. Um, you talked about the uh, Cinefin, the Stacy, I, I see somebody meant, meant, meant mentioned the Stacy metrics, uh, matrix. Is there, is there another one that you you also mentioned? Um, no, actually I didn't explicitly ma ma uh, mention the Stacy metrics. Um, no, you know, the thing is apart from frameworks, so to give an example, this whole thing about the difference between humanities and science actually is the whole neo-Kantian school of thought in the theory of science. It goes back to Max Weber, and you can have it, you know, with, with um, I don't know, uh, Nelson Goodman, for example, Ways of World Making, you'll find it again, you'll find it in many. So it's not, it's not one guy who has written one framework. It's more kind of a whole school of thought that is behind that. Yeah. And um, I think what, what keeps coming to my mind here when we're, we're talking about these things is, is, is the, way, the way our body... <laughs> deals with uh, we're we're using uh, the body is very unique right uh, it's it's a set of a uh, number of systems and yet they all operate together and they're very complex but yet the way they operate together are very uh, and are very unique um, and each moment and each day it's it's always different um, and that, that's 
kind of what I'm hearing. That, that's the analogy I draw for myself um, because I'm intrigued by, um, I'm not in the healthcare space, but I'm intrigued by what, you know, what the body does and what it, what yeah. it can do um, and how it deals with various, uh, you know, situations, right? I find this very, very interesting that you're making this connection because, um, well, I put an analogy on your analogy. Um, if you think about how uh, crossroads are managed and a ordered way of managing crossroads would be the red lights, right? And it's kind of the central command. And if everybody follows it, it's good. If somebody forgets to follow you know, the instructions, then you have a disaster. Um, and if you compare it now to a roundabout, in a roundabout, the, I mean, you have some constraints, like usually, you know, some buildings, some concrete stuff that you can't drive into. But apart from that, uh, some very generous general rules. And then everything else is done by the, by the people in the cars and like motorcycles and whatever. Okay. So, so the people who need to be organized are at the same time as those who organize. And, and so, you know, a complex system organizes a complex system, you know, in a way. Um, and I think in, in, with this whole mind and body or, or the brain within the body is in a way the same thing because it is complex in itself, but it is also our capacity to deal with the complexity outside. And um, it's interesting that you mentioned this. There is a series of BBC films that I um, can recommend to anybody. It's called The Brain by David Eagleman. Uh, they're, they're actually on YouTube for free now, so um, uh, it's very easy. And there are so many little exercises from, from neuroscientists mm -hmm. that if you, if you know how to work with metaphors, you can use them in trainings about, I mean, I use some of them in trainings about, you know, getting people to better understand how the way to deal with complexity is fundamentally different from the way that we are because so much in our you know economic and in a professional world it's about order and how to deal with order right and that's okay i mean you, you can't have a factory which which doesn't have some degree of order in it. um uh, thank you and you uh we're tracking together and i I'm, I'm glad we could do that um could you uh in the chat box uh bernard uh identify what that what that is, or at least provide that to Pierre, so we all can get that as to what the brain is all about, uh, or um, right, what those things are, are. Are thank you very much. Um, I there was one thought I had, but um, uh, yeah, I'm and I'm just getting used to what roundabouts are. Uh, we don't have too many of them in the, here in the states, um, so yeah, yeah, here, yeah, I see laughter. Um, yeah, uh, <coughs> that was a brainchild, I think, of somebody in Europe. Um, no, you have to you have to watch the magic roundabout in Swindon. Yes, emergent behavior. Then this this opened your mind completely. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. See. Yeah. I just got told that I was there's a judgment there. I heard Pierre. <laughs> uh, wow, man. I just talk just talk about roundabouts. Very good. Um, I, and, and I, um, I'm, I'm with you about um, all of the uh, the metaphors, and um, there's so many of them I could, you know, you know that I have. But the body is uh, the best one, right? Um, actually, just learning about a, there's actually a, uh, there's, there's, they said there's a, some sort of brain that's actually between hmm. your digestive system and and your brain, uh, that, uh, or not your brain, but uh, Anyways, uh, I, I, yeah. I, went, I went off the track there. Uh, yeah. Anyway, um, um, to pick up from what you just said, um, I am experimenting with how to help, if you want, because I think all you know, most of us are some kind of coaches, consultants, and so on. We all want to help, and and we all realize that there are se several things which make this actually. No, that's wrong. That's wrong. We want to make money. Right. That's something. Oh, like that. yeah, yeah, of course. Um, uh, no, I want to make gratitude, and usually that's expressed in money. Um, mm -hmm. But anyway, um, so, so I'm experimenting with different things. One of them I'm just sending you in the chat part um, is called uh, Delete the Fairy Tales. I'm writing little stories which are usually they are satire, they are not about 
office world, but they are about something completely different. But they are about things like, you know, delegating and decision making and stuff like that. So just to offer other ways, not to offer solutions, but to offer other ways of looking at themselves to people. Um, and another thing that I'm that, that is not published yet, uh, but I'm I'm going to. Um, <laughs> some of you might know that there are. Uh, it is a thing called. It's actually here. Um, a, a musician called Brian Eno has written a number of cards called oblique strategies, and therefore the creative process. When you're stuck as a creative person in your process and says stuff like, you know, take your last mistake and try doing the opposite, or something like that, or take your last mistake and try doing it again, um, and making it productive. Yeah, I like so to do like very open kind of almost obscure kind of kind of hints that in many cases are absolutely not useful. But if you go through them, you know, sometimes say, yeah, I might look at my situation like that. Let's see what happens. And um, I'm in the process of writing oblique strategies for leaders because I think there you, you it's maybe not about getting stuck, but it's about um, simply if you sit back and reflect then what can, what can be helpful on this reflection? And I'm trying to find these kind of, you know, one sentence things, questions sometimes, statements sometimes, sometimes just a few words, sometimes, you know, just something like the burden of command can trigger off a whole internal discussion about, do you want this? Do I avoid it? Do I want to take it? Do, is it actually, can it make it go away? Uh, is it good? Is it bad? All this kind of stuff. So you want so, to make a workshop on haikus? In a way, yeah. yeah. Uh, so we so we don't so we don't all have to be greedy bastards like Pierre, right? No, I'm not the best. <laughs> I'm a very lovely person. Um, I have a question here in the audience. Come on, yeah, it's your time. Okay, um, you you were talking about these uh, complex uh, organizations, and um, when you change something, that you have to measure how it um, reacts. Uh, do you have some tools or some mechanisms that you would uh, recommend to measure these these things? Um, it, no, I think the whole point of the talk is exactly no, because it depends so much on the context. Um, on the level of principles, I would give you something else, actually. Um, <coughs> this, is, this comes from way back in my training as a, as a leadership trainer. When you talk about SMART objectives, usually, you know, this acronym SMART, and then you have the M for measurable. And measurable only, you know, there, is, there are people who say you can only manage what you can measure, and to me that is a way too narrow way of, you know, the kind of old bad way of management. I believe you can interact in a, in a productive way with many things that you cannot measure, but what you can is evaluate. So if you think about it and say, you know, not just how can I measure how the system reacts, but how can I observe how the system reacts and get a kind of observation that is useful for my next decision, then that doesn't necessarily have to be a number. This is a marvelous cliffhanger to a session that maybe I want to propose about agile system dynamics. Mm -hmm. Which is to measure so only... Not, not, you know, Measure when it's helpful, don't measure when the, the real important stuff, things like customer satisfaction, you know, what is, how precise is a, is, a, is a service level to customer satisfaction and really the readiness of, of, you know, of how they behave, will they buy more, will they recommend us and so on. I make a difference between measures and KPIs, KPIs which is for me different. Uh, measures is in, in system, you analyze the system, the interaction of the agents in the system, uh, like in a complex system. If the system, is, there's no interaction, maybe just your system isn't complex, maybe in the agile way of doing things. This is something that you can see and you can take action on it. Uh, but these are not really KPIs. You cannot measure, oh, this yeah. system is highly dynamic or alone. It makes just no sense at all. Um, let me give you an example. I have a case study of, of Zara, of the fashion brand Zara. Um, that because I'm right, basically, I'm in the process of writing a book about this amber compass, this, the compass that I've shown you. And um, what they do, for example, uh, every week, every head of a, of a shop or department in the shop, depending on, on how big it is, 
um, has a phone call into, well, it actually has three phone calls because men's, women's, and children's wear is, is separate, but into this central command room. And the central command room is a huge area where, for example, for women's fashion, you have the designers, the market specialists, the product managers together. And they, they work in a way that, you know, they hear what's going on left and right, although they have to concentrate on their own part of work. And this is a very informal way of actually of, of opening up the constraints. Anything can happen there. Any kind of conversation between anybody can happen there. Now imagine that all the branch offices have, sometimes it's 10 minutes, sometimes it's half an hour of conversation a week with one person in that room, every week. Apart from the numbers, of course, they have systems with inventory and stuff and how much they are selling of what and so So one part is the numbers, but now they're having stories. And just to give you a story of what happened because of these kind of phone calls. Um, so at one point, there was a, a woman who came into a shop in Japan, I think it was, who asked for a pink scarf. And they didn't have pink scarves. And um, so the guy mentioned it in this weekly conversation. And... Um, what happened was that some other people in the room had a similar thing. So they had, there were, I think, five or six people who said, well, I had a woman asking for a pink scarf in one of the, the branch offices that has talked to me as well. And what happened was that within, I think, within about five days, they have produced 500,000 pink scarves, flooded the shops with that, and in less than a week, they were sold out. So you have this extreme sensibility to something that seems to be a fashion, no idea why. Was it a TV show, well, you know, Sex and the City or something that people were walking around with pink scarf? No idea. But they said if, if at, in one week we have five people from different parts of the world asking for pink scarves, that must be a thing. Let's, you know, let's make it big. That has absolutely that nothing to do with measuring, but it has a lot of to, to do with sensing and with evaluating. And with, you know, it, it's very kind of rough kind of experience tells us that this is such a rare event that there must be something. It's worth trying. And, you know, the worst case, the 500,000 scarves will take a few weeks or months to sell. So what? I just want to, I have to leave now. So I just have to <laughs> thank you for the, for the course, for the presentation. And also, if you can send to Pierre or to us um, this case study about Zaha, I found it really interesting. Sorry, what should, yeah. I, should I, what should I send? Sorry, I didn't get that. This, this case study about Zaha that you just mentioned. Uh, I'm afraid I can't because I'm, I'm, I still have to check that with the company. About the retail, the woman going in yeah. Japan and they have the control center. If you, I don't know, if you have it, um, you can maybe give to Pierre and then he send us uh, in the link later on on the meetup. And also, Pierre, if you can also send, as you said, um, the mention about the, the training program, so you give the three days training program. Also really yeah, that. and Dave, I will do this. I will make this by tomorrow. The thing is here is maybe you can talk with Bernard privately, so I will give him his uh, email address. Yeah, okay. And <clears throat> so, and you have to know, this is recorded, and then I will put this on YouTube. I don't want having. I want to keep Bernard as a friend as long as possible. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's absolutely fine. So, um, just for everyone, I'm putting the link to the training into the chat, so you can have a look there. Um, if you if you are interested, just write an email to me. Um, you know, then I can give you the offer code and so on to get to get the discount. That's very sweet of you. Thank you so much. Any other questions in the audience? <coughs> we need one remark. Okay, because the camera is there. Yeah, the camera is there, and so I have to. I just want to say because I've heard the word leadership. And uh, how does it, uh, how is it compatible with the agile world? Because that is, sounds very normative. People from the leadership. They are giving the norms. So, uh, what we uh, can say about this? <coughs> uh, for who do we want to have the answer? From Bernard? Bernard, uh, he's the speaker. <laughs> Bernard? Uh, I, I didn't understand. It was too far away from the mic. Can you repeat, Pierre? Yeah? What was the uh, question? Okay, you so, spoke too much about. Uh, you have to come you here. Spoke about yeah, you have to come closer uh, because the room, yes. there is an echo in the room. Yeah, okay. You spoke about leadership. 
So yeah. uh, leadership for me is always a very um, uh, anti-agile uh, world. So what what can you say um, uh, about this? Because uh, I see there are some compatibility problems. Okay. Um, yeah. So. Huh. The brain is amongst you. What, what I'm doing now is making a reference to the viable system model from Zap and Beer. Um, basically, I think it's extremely helpful if you think on... Well, well, first I have to make a bracket. So some people make a huge point about the difference between management and leadership. And, you know, some of these arguments are good. Some of them are not so good. What I find is very important is that if you look at what happens in practice, it's extremely rare that the thing that is good to happen is only management and zero leadership, or the thing that is good to happen is only leadership and zero management. It's usually a mixture of both. And I would like to call this um, the fulfilling the job of making sure that the organization you know, performs, that the organization delivers the results that it's supposed to, to deliver. Everything that is contributes to make sure that it happens, so not doing the delivery of the result, but make sure that it happens from coordination over orientation and so on, or over resource allocation and so on. This is something that needs to happen. And that's now the thing. So when I say leadership in your case now, leadership needs to take place. There needs to be a common idea of what we are about to do here. There needs to be Something or you know something that needs to happen is, for example, motivation that is strong enough that even the difficult parts can be overcome in work. Um, there needs to be an alignment that produces a consistency, for example, across the customer experiences. I have never talked about the person doing that. It just needs to happen. Now, sometimes that happens as a distributed function of the group. Sometimes you can even have a process or a document who, who, who contributes to making sure that that happens. So then the process or the document has a leadership function. So I always talk about function. Maybe sometimes there is one person who is called the leader who does that. He, he never does everything of that. So when you talk about this thing that, you know, what needs to happen, what kind of leadership needs to take place, then I think it's not anti-agile. When you say... Everything about leadership is one person and he gets paid more than everybody else and usually wears a dark suit and tie and, and, and he's not involved in the team, then it's anti-agile. So now the, the, the answer of agilists. Is it agile we have leaders? We, have more, we try to avoid having managers because the purpose of agility is having self-managed people. So you cannot have managers because but you can manage maybe a system. But this is the share thing, a leader, and another thing is, usually we say uh, everyone can be a manager in a structure, it's your position in the company, but the leader is the guy who wants to help you, that you are asking for help, mm -hmm. is somebody who is recognized by the team, by his peers. So you can't be, now I want to be a leader. You know? I think also with the manager, I, I don't agree because, because then you're just assuming that somebody gets the title of manager, but somebody who does the job right, you know, it's like, I don't think it's a question of talent and so on, but it's a question of knowing what the job is. And, you know, like being a, a baker, you need to make an apprenticeship as a baker in order to be a baker. So, so um, I think with the, with the manager, we are talking about this, the same thing. Um, still, you know, what, what I see is sometimes, and that's maybe more the teal part than, than the management, uh, the, the agile part. Um, when you take this thing to the extreme, I, for example, personally, I haven't seen a well-working way of um, making, especially firing uh, decisions in, a, in an agile team that is not taken out of. Yeah, that is correct. Uh, so this is not clear, but sometimes it is, uh, I had teams recruit, recruiting mates. But one another, another point which is very interesting is Ricardo Semler uh, from Semco. He explained in a, one of the talk available on YouTube that uh, they celebrate, the, the, the board of directors celebrated three years without taking any decision. And he explained that. Even a leader is not a permanent job. 
Yeah. Think about it. Uh, I I look at you know John Maxwell who talks about leadership all you know all the time, and it's about being a servant, right? How well can you help the people that are a part of your team, and as opposed to a manager, I look as somebody that tells them what to do, right? Um, so yeah, there's different ways to look what at they, them. What I see very helpful, and by the way, this is also going back to Stanford Beer. Um, is if you, you know, a generic way of defining what organizations are there for, um, it's the purpose of the organization is what it does. And what it does has to do with the outside world. So if it's a commercial organization, it's not about making money. More money is not the purpose. It's a result of having a well-chosen the purpose and executing well on the purpose. Then you get money as a side effect. But um, uh, the perp you know, if, if you are Coca-Cola, the purpose is to sell beverages and to provide the, way, the, the world with beverages. And um, you know, if as a leader, I believe, if you say as a leader, your job is the capability of the organization to deliver on that purpose, then you're automatically a servant leader. You're, you're sometimes a servant leader against the interests of some employees because, you know, it, it's a crappy job that they have to do now, but somebody has to do it. And, some, some, and then the leader's job is to represent the interests of the purpose of the organization. It needs to be done because otherwise customers won't like it. And not of the person who wants to have an easy life, maybe. But in general, that con conflict, you know, happens only rarely. And in general, you have an alignment between the interests of, of any employee and, and the purpose of the organization. And therefore, um, the, the leader who serves the purpose of the organization serves the interest of the of people. Yeah, um, I disagree a little bit here because then Dave Snow mentioned something very interesting is the position of a leader is to be a constructive irritant. Yeah. Uh -huh. Which is not only, you don't need as a leader to be very nice or kind or be a servant. It's not your purpose. Your purpose is giving leadership direction is the purpose mm, I, I, I would make that dependent on the level um, I think if you look about the the uh, so th there are some leaders um, who's you know if the job is designed like that who have a job which is very much making sure the operation runs yep. uh, and these people I think should not be constructive irritants and there are people who have to make sure that the operation is also successful in the future. So we're talking about improvement, about questioning the ways you do it, and so on. And um, sometimes it's the same person, but in different moments. But when it's about just, you know, get, make sure the flow happens and make sure that, uh, you know, the results happen in a very short term, then maybe there is not a good moment for, for irritation. And when it's about, let's think about how we, can we, how we can do better, then it's a good moment for irritation. So actually, we're again in the center of our talk. You know, it's, it's, it's about, it depends on the context. Yeah, the context, uh, usually in company, you have three <coughs> years. You have this innovation, innovative approach, which has to be very completely open. And you have this manufacturing process, which is, has to be as stable as possible, which is different. Yes. You cannot yes. address this Absolutely. with an angle. So usually we are addressing this Scrum or whatever, and we are using Scrum as just a simple organization model that you can apply the agile manufacturing principles in the more systemic uh, way of working uh, when you have to think about the architecture, which uh, not the management style is agile, but the, the, the way you're thinking, the nature of your work and what you're doing in your relationship, because the life cycles are longer. Actually, um, what I see in classical organization is often this change of, of you know, priority <laughs> is connected to the situation in the hierarchy. So, for example, I've had, um, uh, you know, participants in my trainings um, who had two levels of, of management below. So they were team leader, department leader, and they were one, of, of, uh, one above them. They usually had a few hundred people on their responsibility. And at least the good ones amongst them, there was a discussion. And the good ones amongst them said, if in my position I'm involved in the daily operation of the business, then something is wrong. 
You know, if I need to sign off stuff and to make sure that, oh, you know, take, um, extinguish all these little fires and so on, and that my organization can't do that without me, then something is wrong. And what you also realize is that, that they, they usually say in the lower part of the organization, if you, if you take 360 degrees, you know, managing your, your um, direct reports, managing your colleagues, the other teams, and managing upwards, in the lower part, maybe the main focus is downwards. Whereas in that higher part, the main focus, fo focus is sideways and upwards. And there, this whole thing about being a construction, I I constructive irritant to your organization becomes absolutely central. Yeah. And maybe, you yeah. know, being a connector and a negotiator and so on to the other parts of the organization is also extremely important, which you cannot necessarily expect from a team leader. Yeah, because the, 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 the idea behind constructive irritant is that you build a resilient system, which doesn't well, define. Yeah. And, that, and that's also very similar, uh, Bernard, to what you just mentioned is to what Jeff Bezos is saying. Um, you know, he, d he doesn't make but, m what, two or three decisions a day, right? And <laughs> he's, he's spending his time working on things that, you know, here it is 2019. He's working on things that are 20, 2021, 2022, right? He's, he's spending on his time on those things. He's, yeah. he's empowered or he's let the people at, at that one level uh, make all the decisions, right, on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Um, sometimes I use, now that's my way of being a constructive irritant. I, I use uh, a negative example. You're doing uh, from Harry Potter. Doing well. Oh wow! Usually, Bernard. <laughs> um, so, from from Harry Potter, if you think about, you know, when the towards the end, when the baddies have taken over the Ministry of Magic, and Voldemort is kind of the head of everything, there are so many top managers. If they were Voldemort, they would spend most of their time in the office running the Ministry of Magic, but he doesn't. He has everybody else run it now in his way, probably through fear, which is very much in line with what he's all about. But anyway, he, he chases around in the world searching that one thing that will change everything in their favor. Most of the time, that's not in the Ministry of Magic. That's somewhere else. And I think just with that, with that analogy, you can, you know, there are so many, so many top managers who, who, who don't do that. You know, that's, that's why in, in Germany, we have a chancellor. And we have a president. Nobody knows the president. Everyone who knows the chancellor is He's looking for the other one. Yeah, that's that's the idea. Having a CEO, a CEO, and having a CEO. <coughs> so the the guy who's doing the job is the CEO, and the other has to think about it. Another point, very interesting, is also what the Norwegians guys are doing. And usually, they hired as a CEO of the company, a philosopher, somebody thinking about the purpose of the company. Which is quite interesting. Uh, thank you, thank you, first of all, for uh, for uh, uh, the session. I think it's really uh, interesting topics and interesting discussion we are having here. Um, just want to <coughs> uh, focus a, a little bit point more on the on this this uh, uh, paradigm between uh, leader, manager, uh, and the limitations on on the leadership uh, depending on the levels. I think it's it's quite challenging when when you. When you are on on a hierarchy level and uh, and you want to to lead and to incentivize and empower uh, your, your your team, but unfortunately the priorities of, of the organization do not uh, match with the priorities that you have, and and then it, it becomes uh, crucial that you change the priorities, and uh, then I, I think it's uh, it makes a little bit sense what what you were um, showing in the beginning with with this compass compass where where you put uh, experiment and I, I think that uh, many times leaders do need to break rules and do need to go against the priorities of their own organizations because only by by questioning they can really find out uh, how, how far they can they can evolve but I find it it's quite challenging this this uh, this this uh, so this decision of, of until which point can a leader really uh, uh, change the priorities and change the direction and break the rules. This is something that um, uh, I don't know if you have 
and if anyone yeah. has any thoughts about it or, or, um, or well there is something questions. something i might add um and, and probably in, in it actually that could be very helpful again um because it's easier to to apply um so what you're saying is is you know in a way if you if you don't feel the boundaries then you're not pushing hard enough you're not expanding you're only you know if you want to expand yeah. as much as you can yeah. then that means you hit the wall every now and then I and mean, of you, course, you, you gotta, you gotta fail, right? Because otherwise, yeah. And there is, yeah. there is something that actually comes very much from Dave Snowden. Um, you know, the, the naive way is we need a failure culture. Let's be open to risk and mistakes. Don't be so cautious and so on. But anyway, if things go bad, then you've been going to be hit very hard yeah, by right, you know right. uh, lose your job or anything. That's an absurd request yeah. to people. That's completely absurd. So the more interesting question is, what do you need to build in the architecture of the system so that people have a different approach towards failure? And that means how can you make failure actually safe? So how can you make sure that we can make experiments in the lab in, in a context which tells us the truth, tells us something that we can, you know, that is the case in the real world, but in a way that when things go bad, the damage is very small. Um, uh, you mean that could, it's, it's, and, and for example, one way of doing this is, is A-B testing. I've, I've just uh, learned well some time ago. Um, if you look at um, uh, a company like Airbnb, apparently every day there are about a thousand A-B tests running on their website. Now, if you manage these A-B tests, um, you know, what you should see is there must be a certain degree of failure. If all these A-B tests are about minuscule improvements and every improvement works well, then people are not pushing hard enough. You know, so you, you think, it, once you think about the portfolio of things that you're trying, you can say, you know what, this portfolio should include some, you know, almost certain success kind of things, which the risk is so low, but also the, the, the benefit that you will get is probably not too high because it's, 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 stuff that is almost evident that it's going to be, to be successful. And it needs also to include some parts which are at a very high risk because it's really an assumption. You have no idea whether it's going to work or not. But if it works, then it's going to be a great benefit. So how can you make, establish such a portfolio and make it, so for example, in one context where um, there is a company where we are, well, the experiment or the danger of the experiment is actually that we are proposing something that goes against the 50 years history of the companies. It's questioning one of the most fundamental principles of how they deal with, with internal numbers, basically. And um, uh, the, the way to propose it to the owner is actually that we say, you know, how much at the moment you're assuming that this is still the right decision. You have no evidence. How much are you ready to risk in order to get evidence? Get from assumption-based to evidence-based. How much is this worth? And in this case, we're not even about talking about losing customers or losing turnover. You're basically turn, you know, risking having a slow, smaller margin. So the question is, okay, let's give us a number. How much less margin are you ready to kind of put on, the, on, on a bet in order to find out evidence? And with that, we can then say, okay, that means we have so many people who do it on such an account and for so long time. And, you know, if, that, if, if they will lose so much margin, then um, uh, we will count the experiment and say, okay, it, it, it apparently it, it, let's stay the way that we are. And, and by that, uh, um, the idea is to get, in this case, the owner into a position where he said, you know what, I am gaining, I'm learning something. And if something fails then nothing bad happens i'm you know i'm putting a number on on this on this failure and that's okay if that happens but that's the worst that can happen that we can stop it at that moment we are certain that we can stop it at that moment it's this controlled way of of testing things it's uh, yeah i think it's quite interesting thank you any other questions in the audience um i just see there was a question for you Pierre. i'm going to answer it for you yeah, Pierre, you, you cited the, uh, the roundabout. I, I put uh, it there. It's on YouTube, there is a short film of about four minutes of a young guy who explains stuff um, yeah. about the Swindon magic roundabout. Still trying to figure out the magic of a roundabout. But. <laughs>
It's one, by the way, it's in my training, I use this as the kind of entry question to, to discuss the difference between ordered and complex. And if you ah. think about things like, like, so what happens if somebody makes a mistake? Usually on roundabout, people have already a heightened attention to, you know, it could be that the other guy doesn't see me or something like that, so therefore I'm already careful. If, if there is somebody coming at high speed, I become more careful. Um, whereas on a, on, when, if you have a green light, you never even think, you know, you, you don't watch whether other cars pass at the red light. So you never even imagine that that happens. Therefore, it might, you know, there might be less act often that somebody makes a mistake, but if they do, the risk is much, much higher. Um, think about also something like partial knowledge. Um, so if you have an intelligent steering of, of, uh, of red lights and green lights, there needs to be a central position in, I mean, in the computer that knows everything, that knows the position of all the lights and everything, everything needs to be connected, otherwise it doesn't work. Now, if you have a roundabout, um, as a, you know, I'm approaching a roundabout. Well, I have to understand, is there enough place that I can get my car in? Is somebody coming who has right of way or not? So can I, can I move in or not? And that's as much as I need to know. There is the whole other part of the roundabout where so much else is going on. I don't need to know anything about that in order to make my decision. So I'm fine with taking a decision based on a very uh, small sector of knowledge about the whole reality. And it's okay. So to me, this is, if in a way, an intelligent architecture of a framework that makes sure that people can, can do that. And actually, that's... Um, I've once read that somewhere uh, and, and it sticks with me, especially when we have, you know, things like in Agile or Teal, often you have a bashing of the old, you know, everything was bad in Taylorism and the old organization and so on and hierarchy is bad and all these kind of things. I think it's a bit fast in terms of, yes, there is a lot of things which is not apt for today's challenges, but it doesn't mean that, you know, everything was, was, was bad all the time. Um, if you think about it, the purpose of the organization there are two things that an organization in terms of, you know, who does what and so on needs to do. One of them is any kind of operation has not enough resources to do everything that would be a good idea. So therefore, every kind of operation needs to have a way to attribute resources to priorities against other arguments, which are also good arguments to, to use them in a different way. That needs to happen. The old way was let hierarchy decide that. Um, now, in, and the other one, and that's the more important one, and that's connected to this roundabout where you, it's enough to know just a little bit. <laughs> and the pur purpose of an organization is to make sure that the amount of knowledge and information that you need to do your job is at human scale. So an organization where you have a large number of people working together and everybody knows, needs to know everything else about everything in the co company will not work because the effort to get that knowledge uh, to that level is consuming so much of your time that you can't do your job anymore. And that's, for example, if, if you have ex examples mm -hmm. of uh, holacracy gone bad, where you have too, mo too many circles who are spending too many times about how can we, you know, how are we doing it, what should we organize and so on and nobody's really doing the productive work, um, then, you know, that's a risk. So no matter well, how you organize yourself, also in flat ways, old hierarchical ways, these two tasks of an organization need to be fulfilled in any case. So also when you look at a stoplight, right, or a go light, whatever you want to call it, right, a red light, uh, you, you have people sitting idle, right? That, that, that might be considered characterized as a meeting, right? Where people are actually doing almost nothing, right? Yes. Sitting. And, and I, I'm, I'm hearing your, and Carlos, thanks for your, uh, your tidbits down in the, the chat as well. Uh, I'm, I'm seeing them and thank you. Um, gee, you may even convert me here, guys. Um, I mean, you know, uh, uh, yeah, there's, there's, they're implementing them in, in various places here, um, and the ones they have implemented, they have taken them like over over a year to to do them. Um, it's just you know, and they're not really complex uh, intersections either. 
um, but yeah. they removed the stoplights. We are having here on the continent. We are actually having something something else. It's good. well. There are some examples in in Netherlands, in Germany, um, here in Switzerland. We have something similar. Is you remove everything. You just say there are no signs, no, you know, who gives right of way or anything, nothing. What happens? And, you know, we're talking about villages, so small villages where you do that. What happens? Everybody slows down. Everybody takes care everywhere, you know. And here in Switzerland, we have it. It's called uh, Zone 20, so maximum 20 kilometers an hour. And, um, you know, every, so children, people on, on foot and so on have, have right of way. And everything else is open to negotiation. So uh, a lot of us also to use in my trainings, the analogy, but a little bit different. It's about the debit. So a lot, when you have these uh, traffic lights, it's more likely uh, related, uh, related to uh, scientific management, about more control. It's about mass production. Yeah. But when you increase the debit with mass customization, you have to think, think about system thinking. And then you have the roundabouts. The problem is now we increase again the debit. Is now we are reaching what is about a sense making approach. Is uh, and then here is the magic roundabout. A little bit interesting. It sounds complicated. It isn't, but this allows emergent behavior, which is absolutely key. And there is a key for agility in in yes. this way. Is about we are touching something. Is called flocking behavior. Is grouping, ungrouping, emergent behavior then uh, closing and having this like these waves all the time but i think inter so and that makes the, the magic roundabout even more interesting because usually in one round the magic roundabout is basically five roundabouts around a, arranged in a circle and what that means is that there are several ways you can get to the same destination there are several alternatives and the advantage is that now that you know if if w at one point people you know cars are clogged then there are still okay let's take this way and you can people can make this kind of decision and um and therefore it's much more flexible now what does that imply it implies that you must not have a plan where i mean you have a plan in terms of where you want to get out but amongst the several variants that you have to get there you must not have a decision from the very beginning but you take small iterative decisions about the next move all the time and you're open to alternatives. If that alternative looks bad, okay, you take the other one. And now that's a metaphor you can use, that you can say, okay, self-organization implies, a certain, and especially, I would say even more, adaptability of an organization implies a certain openness. Sometimes it's better to be less precise you will have the precision in the end. You know, whenever you make a step, you will be precise about the step, but you don't have to be precise at the next five steps. So, so this idea of taking back, of being less precise, is actually um, a part of the mindset that you need in order to, be, to move and behave in such a context. And, well, um, Bernard, uh, um, the, the, somebody put it in the, in, the, in the chat also, this thing about Vietnam and places like that where you have no rules. Well, that's the thing, you, you have no explicit rules. Mm -hmm. But what you have is tons of heuristics. This is another exercise that I do sometimes. I have a video of a, of a Hanoi crossroads. And I ask people, okay, what are rules of thumb that are being followed here? And people come up like with 20 of them. It's like, you know, follow somebody else who goes in the same direction. Never make an abrupt movement. Always be constant both in the speed and in, in uh, how, you know, how, how much you turn to the left or to the right. Um, uh, only watch the part that is in front of you, don't care about behind you, that's the other people's problem. Um, uh, form groups, if, if, you know, follow a flock, but if then some, the flock is starting becoming difficult, then okay, you make a new flock and you start a new flock. All things like that. Uh, match the speed to the people around you. Um, uh, never assume that, uh, you know, people have seen you. Uh, stuff that's like that. Not, that's not valid. I, I give you a counter example. That's not valid. I tried to cross a road, a four-way, highly uh, crowded road in Jakarta last year. And I, I, I walked one kilometer. I said, where, where can I cross the road? Then I asked a policeman, is AJ, just the way, pass through it. I said, what? <laughs> then I came yeah. here like a European, I passed through, and everyone stopped. 
because this is the rules. And, and yeah. In, yeah. In, in India, there is uh, rules is the, the biggest law is has priority because yeah. it hurt you. But it's, the cow has the most priority. And they, they, but this is cultural. Yeah. But in the meantime, this is also valid for the, the debit, what we say. So I have friends, colleagues from India, when I come to Germany, say, oh, we are happy because we can drive here. So what? Yeah, we're going on German highways, which is very systemic. It's straight, very straight line. No, more partly no speed limit, and you can bomb, which is not possible in Asia. Yeah, of course. In Vietnam, you can't because you have to respect the rules, like, like the test in Netherlands, maybe in the Swiss, in Switzerland, it's too. If it's completely open, you can't. Still, I mean, so, so I think, again, we are at the context specific. Mm -hmm. We shouldn't, I mean, I'm using this Vietnam example as well. Let's not over glorify it. It's still one of the countries with the highest death rates in, in traffic accidents. Yep. So, uh, you know, mm. it, mm. it, it gives you to think. Um, yeah. Where, 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 do most, where do most accidents happen in the United States? At intersections. At intersections. Ah, okay. Whether, whether it's with a stoplight or with a stop sign or whatever, it's at an intersection. Right. Yeah, because you create exceptions, Paul. Because right. if you're in an intersection in the U.S., even if you have a red lamp and you want to turn right, you're allowed to turn right. Well, by the way, what's also interesting is that, um, you know, the difference is if you take, I mean, Switzerland, you know, we are so rule obeying and so on. So if you take the traffic rules here, I mean, we are so rule obeying <laughs> that we help other people off if they don't <laughs> obey the rules, you know, this kind of thing. So, um, so, so that allows for a little space of maneuver between these rules. If you look at heuristics, you can influence them. And that's also something interesting in a complex system. You, you don't only have to, you know, it's not the system out there. I'm not in the system and therefore I have to perceive it and then I do something. No, by perceiving, I'm already interacting with the system. I'm part of this system. Just to give you another, yes, yes. <laughs> South of France, it's in a private villa. So this is really a nice location as well. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> so Paul, no excuses now. You have to come. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. Uh, maybe the maybe the rich guy that that held the conference here can can you know foot the bill for the plane ticket there, Pierre. Um, mm -hmm. But talking about making a lot of Find money. Find a customer. <laughs> okay, okay guys. just add a few days. So uh, uh, hey, we could I could talk about this stuff all day. So this is good stuff. Thanks, yeah, Pierre. Thanks, I love man. I love this situation now. I can be a real badass. We'll send to all crowd all the links, what you have said and everything uh, in, in a set of email. And I was so happy to see Elsa. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was really uh, spannend. Cool. Sure. I have a lot okay. of time to run around. Thank you. Okay. You have to take care. We see each other in June in Berlin. For yeah. Play 14. Wonderful. Okay, guys. Well, okay, love. thanks a lot. Very soon. Have the rest of your day. Bye bye. Take care. Thank you. Have a good day. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. Thank you.